Okay, I, we are live. So welcome everyone. Thank you for coming to the latest installment of Web3 Talks. Uh, and today we're gonna be talking about decentralized identity, uh, building blocks for a better web. Um, so a lot of, a big pillar of Web3 is identity and having decentralized identity is a big part of this. So today we're gonna be talking about Many of the ways how blockchain technology can enable new type of identity infrastructure we have not seen yet, and that many some of the guests here are building. We're going to talk about some examples of uh, use cases that are happening, and some some uh, current solutions to identity and data management in the blockchain space and in the in the traditional markets as well. We're going to talk about self-sovereign identity and start off with uh, defining what decentralized identity is about. So today joining us, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Jesus Ruiz, from, who's a member of the board and CTO of Illustria. We have Jun Li, founder of Ontology, and Ingo Ruba, founder of, and CEO of uh, Bot Labs, which is a uh, stewarding the kilt protocol so to begin um i'd like to ask ingo um what is identity and what is decentralized identity and is it is that the right term to call this what we're doing here yeah so um that, that's a that's a very interesting question actually what is identity and i think in this space we are always mixing up or not always but a lot mixing up identifiers and identities so everybody's talking basically about dids and say this is decentralized identity actually google it it's not uh it's just a decentralized identifier so uh what's an identifier first so an identifier in this call would probably ingo would be a very good identifier for me it just says this is the guy who's just right now talking. Uh, everybody could identify me on that, but that is definitely not my identity, right? My identity is much more. My identity is that I'm European. My identity is that I can drive a car, that I have a company, uh, that I'm the CEO of the company, and many, many more things. And uh, in the normal world, we actually reflect those pieces which come together to an identity with credentials. So uh, I do have for example, a driver's license, and I do have a commercial register um, a thingy where uh, it says that I'm the CEO of a company, and I also have a passport which says that I'm European. So all those credentials together with my identifier add up to my identity. And uh, this is, I think that this is the most crucial thing that we have to understand that, uh, for example, when we talk about DID, this is just an identifier, it's just a number. It doesn't say anything about identity. Identity is much more and uh, the, the goal that we have and the, and the task that we all have is actually bring the identity to the digital world, to have a representation of our digital identity or of our personal identity somehow in the digital world. And uh, so, and, and this is why we use not only DIDs, this is why we use two types of things. We use DIDs for anchoring uh, an identifier and then we attach in the digital world, lots of credentials, digital credentials uh, to this identifier. And then we start constructing a digital identity. So this is my view. That's yeah, it's really interesting. There is, it's important to note that some of this, uh, as we're building new decentralized identity, that it can uh, change a lot of the terms we've been uh, used to and using uh, very easily in the past. So like uh, for, for Jun Li, um, you're building a new uh, identity solution and how does blockchain enable this preferred identity solution for ontology? Yeah, um, it's a best on blockchain, it's more like a decentralized <laughs> identity. Um, currently, in country, you can see a lot of identity is uh, stored in the centralized uh, the database, central database, and uh, centralized solution for that. But uh, identity, actually, everyone, even every entities, maybe a devices, uh, maybe a, a organization, an individual, have a different kind of identity, maybe nationality, 
maybe your education background, maybe your work experience. So many things in the so many scenarios, you will have a different identity. In the blockchain, maybe your Bitcoin account or Ethereum account, Bitcoin account is kind of identity. You don't know what kind of real person behind the, the, the account. So ontology based on the blockchain, they as a ledger help you to manage the all kinds of identity, all kinds of verification data source by yourself. And you can use blockchain as a decentralized approach to manage all the data linked to you. And you can use different kind of data set in different scenario. You can uh, send your data or uh, allow people to, to use your data or use your verification for you. But no any kind of centralized database will control your data, will control your identity, will control the verification process. But even it's a decentralized solution, it's still involving the centralized verification private, maybe from governments, maybe from uh, the other kind of centralized company. They can prove your nationality or prove your work experience, education background. That's fine. We use a decentralized way to manage a centralized and a decentralized data source and identity verification process. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Um, next question is for um, Jesus. Uh, there's a lot, as I said before, we're just beginning to explore this new realm of identity and identification, identifiers, credentials, and all these uh, many terms that have a lot of nuance to them. Um, a lot of terms that are being thrown around in this decentralized identity space is uh, the roles of a tester and verifier. Uh, could you explain what those mean and how they fit into Alastria? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, in Alastria or in any reasonable implementation of decentralized identity or self sovereign identity, okay, because basically we are all doing the same thing around the same standards with differences in practical things, but in general, the philosophy is exactly the same. Okay, now, the best uh, way to think about decentralized identity or self sovereign identity is that it is a digital identity which is uh, up to now the most similar to the physical one. What do I mean with physical one? Think about your personal wallet, your physical wallet, the wallet where you put your national ID, okay, whether you are from the Netherlands or Belgium or Spain or whatever, then you put there your uh, credential, okay, that's a credential, then you put your driver's license, you put uh, uh, your diploma. Diplomas typically are big, but imagine that you have the same standard, okay? Now, uh the holder in the decentralized identity the holder this is a term for uh, the person holding the credentials so you have the personal data wallet is the digital representation of the physical wallet that you carry with you then you have the credentials which have been generated by the way by attesters for example one government giving you a piece of plastic saying you are a citizen of one country of that country then a bank saying that you are a customer, then uh, the driver's authority of a country or some countries uh, saying that you can drive a car in that region, okay, or in the world, and then you accumulate all of these credentials. So the attesters are typically the uh, entities who know something about you and then assign or some information attached to the identifier, okay? And this is where the identifier is just a way to uh, attach all these different pieces of information and then the collection of information is in reality your whole identity, okay? And then the verifier, okay? Imagine when you are going to uh, rent a car, then they have to check or verify something about you, okay? Who you are and then you give your national driver's license or the passport and then whether you are authorized to drive a car, uh, meaning that you should hold a valid driver's pass, uh, driver's license, okay? Now, having said that, it looks also too centralized, but these credentials can be generated by any attester. The attester can be governments, uh, um, universities with the diploma, or even uh, reputational, okay? So there is no limit on what type of credentials you can accumulate from attesters, you are the holder, and then there's no limit on uh, who are the verifiers or which credentials you give to the verifiers to prove something about you, okay? And then at the end, privacy is uh, the same as with plastic. Imagine about that. The attester gives you a piece of plastic and the verifier 
doesn't have to contact the attester. With the current digital IDs, the, the, the two entities talk to, to each other about you. Okay, this is uh, not very privacy preserving. And by the way, the attester has no idea to which entities you have displayed your uh, plastic uh, things, okay? And this is, again, another privacy feature. So decentralized identity, to me, the, the, the key thing is that it is implementing in the digital world exactly the same model from the privacy perspective and the usability uh, of the physical world. And then the roles are the same, attesters, holders, and verifiers. It's a little bit more complex, but basically that's the idea, okay? So forget about federation of identities, about uh, all these companies knowing everything about us. It's just we manage our own information. Yeah, that's a big part of uh, the Web3 vision as well. Uh, owning our own data and identity is a big part of that as well. It makes perfect sense. Um, so you mentioned that you said there's a lot of, you know, what we know as identity is kind of mostly the same in digital identity. Um, like we have the same kinds of credentials and verifiers and types of people that will be active in, in the coming years regarding digital identity and decentralized identity. Um, Ingo, what are some of the ways that, yeah, we might have the same kinds of identifications for things um, such as my, my own age uh, for purchasing some some alcohol online, for instance. But like what are some other things that could be just brand new that are that decentralized identifiers uh, enable? Yeah, so I think when we uh, when we talk about the this real world or the, uh, the analog world, we always we, we always go in the direction, and we've seen that in the uh, explanations that we heard. It's it's always about people. Um, so it's it's my driver's license. I can drive a car. Cool. Uh, but uh, what is actually not, uh, and this this is basically soft right now, right? Because driver's licenses are okay. They are not digital, but they work. So I can. It's it's a system which basically works. Uh, the problem that we actually see that inside the digital world it doesn't work so if there's uh, for example a service in a cloud environment and this service wants to have an identity and they do have identities because the service will probably want to talk to another service and offer their service to the other thing and then uh, the other service is starting to talk to the service and say hey uh, yeah i would like to work with you but uh, unfortunately for working with me you have to be compliant to something like gdpr or something and then it would be nice if the service could actually hand over a credential to the other service saying yeah this, this is my GDPR license, basically. And uh, this thing hasn't been solved at all. And there's a huge need around Industry 4.0 and all those things uh, where you see uh, a lot of demand uh, in, for industrial appliances for that, because that's uh, that's just a thing that is absolutely necessary and needed. And uh, so it's, I'm, I'm not really sure if the driver's license example, is, it's nice to explain, but uh, as driver's license normally work, we actually don't need to digitize them. Probably it's going to happen maybe in 10 years or so, uh, but there, there's no business need for that. There's, there's, but there's huge business need for other things, uh, like for example, uh, services, IoT devices, and all those things uh, which need to have, which need to build their own identity by being able to show credentials and having them attached to a decentralized identifier. I think there's uh, there's a lot of uh, new things we will we are going to see in the future. Great. Yeah. I would like to add something yeah. uh, uh, just just to, to to stress this fact because when we think about the decentralized identity, we are uh, typically focusing on the on the persons, on natural persons. But for juridical persons, businesses, and entities, there is uh, also a need for doing this. Okay. Uh, uh, Ingo mentioned this, but at the end, for example, in the European Union, you have 30, 30 million businesses. Okay. And then even in the European Union, the identities are not very well homogenized. And then self sovereign identity for the companies, enabling peer-to-peer -peer among companies, because when we talk about peer-to-peer, -peer, we talk about people. But in reality, the wealth of the countries, the GDP, the gross domestic product, is generated by businesses. And this is exactly what we have to do in order to enhance the economy, to, to, to improve the efficiency of the economy by implementing peer-to-peer -peer economy okay, between companies. And self sovereign identity is going to be so much useful for businesses as it is going to be for people and then things and processes and so, on. so any anything will have an identity and then 
a self-sovereign identity uh, to assign credentials to that entity. People, is, business, things, and processes, and many other things. Oh, yeah. So, so the Internet of Things definitely has a lot to do with this yeah. and using all these identifiers. Yeah. Um, that go goes really well into the next kind of uh, string of questions I want to get into, which is about use cases. But before we get into that, I want to remind all the people watching that you can ask questions that I can uh, ask the, the panel uh, after by clicking the ask a question. Uh, button below and just typing in a question. And the others who don't have questions might find another question there that's already interesting. And you can feel free to upvote the ones that are most important to you. Um, so the next uh, question is going into use cases. And um, I'm gonna ask each of your projects about the use cases you're, you're focusing on right now, starting with, um, uh, but one thing to keep in mind, I I'd like to understand there's there could be use cases whether it's government commercial um other businesses and personal means uh but for whatever use case you think of um i'd like to know understand why like these service providers uh these businesses these companies that are working with this what are the benefits they see from having uh digital identifiers that they haven't had before so not only in use cases but what are the benefits on the, on the service side uh, for those verifying these ident identifications, the ones that they need it, or they might be able to enable some new things. So starting with Jun Lee, um, what are some of the use cases you're seeing uh, for uh, ontology? He's muted. Uh, you're muted. Sorry. Ivana, can you uh, unmute him? Sorry. Uh, hold on one second. Well, while, while we get that fixed, I'm sorry, Jun Lee. Okay. Um, then, uh, I'm sorry, Jun Lee. Uh, we'll, we'll find a way to un unmute you soon. In the meantime, uh, Jesus, uh, can, can you, uh, I'd like to know what uh, use cases uh, you're seeing with Elastria right now and how this benefits the service provider. Okay, let me, let me uh, put one related to there are basically two that I like, but one which is related to companies, okay? Because there, were, there was a question in, uh, asked there, okay? For business identities. Now, imagine that in Spain, you have the big banks, by the way, big banks in Europe, then big energy companies, then telcos, then, uh, I mean, big, uh, big companies. Now, uh, it happens that uh, Europe is uh, the region in Europe uh, with the most small and medium enterprises, okay? So the economy depends on the small and medium enterprises, SMEs. Spain in Europe is the country with the most uh, small and medium enterprises, so our economy depends on that very heavily. And then, for example, uh, for those big companies, they serve providers. I mean, providers is uh, wherever they have to buy something, the, 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 the logistics chain. So they serve something like 150,000 providers, sure, among them, the same. So one small company working for one big company has to be certified because there is a certification process every year that has to be done just to uh, guarantee the quality of the service. Because at the end, the, the, the responsible for the uh, end service is the big company. And they have to guarantee the quality of the provision of the services from the small company. So the small companies have to do an exam, a certification every year. This is incredibly costly. And the small company working for several big companies, they have to do this several times, even though they are asking mostly the same questions. So imagine they agree on a common certification process, and then they give, when you have, I am a big company, you are a small company, you certify yourself, I give you my credential, and then you hold a credential like a business, not, people, not person, and then you can prove that you are certified with me to another big company. And then the big company can accept this because we have, uh, let's say, agreed on the same level of, of certification. This is saving a lot of money to the small companies, to the big companies, because onboarding and certification is a cost for both. Uh, it's streamlining the whole process. So it's an enormous amount of money that uh, can be saved. This is one use case that I hope will go into production very soon. And the other one is, again, big companies, energy companies and so on, uh, imagine the following, you are uh, a buyer of a house and then the building company 
okay? No you. But then when you have the house, then you have to contract the gas, water, electricity. And then you have to prove something. This is a nightmare right now with papers. Imagine that the housing company uh, gives you a credential that you are the owner of this house, and then you just present the credential. And then you can sign the contract automatically because the big companies have agreed that they they have agreed on the on the say the level of verification of the credential and then this is good for the citizen for the company who is the utility provider and for the housing company okay and even for immigrants coming to spain to uh, make business okay because then they don't have anything they can open a banking account again just with that identity because the housing provider the housing the, the, the building company knows you perfectly because you have paid a, an enormous amount of money okay and they know you this is identity and this is good for everybody okay. good yeah yeah makes makes sense uh jun lee if if you can hover your cursor over your screen and press unmute that might help we're having difficulties unmuting you um if that's possible that might be the issue um, but going straight, moving along and going straight to Ingo, like what's, what's an example of a use case you're seeing for Kilt that really benefits the service provider? Yeah, so uh, yeah, well, I can maybe make an example, can't really say the names of the companies, but there will be a press release tomorrow. Uh, so uh, mm. it's more from the crypto space, actually, uh, uh, but uh, it might be quite interesting because that's really understandable probably to, uh, to everyone who's in here. Uh, so uh, you all know the problem when you uh, register with a, a centralized exchange that you need a KYC, right? And it's always a little bit annoying to have the KYC again and again. And and normally the KYC provider uh, just doesn't give you the data or uh, you don't own it. Right? It's owned by the KYC provider or by the exchange you, um, you're going with and then you have to do it all over again. And uh, what we're going to announce actually is a collaboration with one of the exchanges and one of the KYC providers. Um, and what we're going to do is that the KYC provider actually issues credentials to the users. So. <coughs> with this KYC provider and then uh, you can uh, you hold this you are the holder of this credential so it's yours you can use it at this one exchange which is starting the project with but hopefully more exchanges will also jump in and say uh, we believe those credentials because they are lawful and whatever and you can reuse your credentials uh, there with the others which is great basically for everyone because the uh, KYC provider they make more business because they have a use case which is far more um, web3 oriented i would say it's great for the exchange because they can uh, uh, they can reuse all the um, uh, all the people who are already registered with the KYC provider, there's, I don't know, 140,000 or so, there, so they have a great customer base for the beginning, which is cool. Um, and it's good for the user because the user can actually do this once and it's probably paid by someone, probably by the exchange, that, uh, because that's onboarding costs. And uh, then they have their credential and they can reuse it with the next exchange or with the, uh, the next thing they want to, um, or want to have uh, their KYC for. So th this is something really, really Really practical as used in the crypto space, and uh, we found great partners to build this with. So th this is, um, yeah, I, I think must be found. Yeah, yeah, it's good, and I think we can hear Jun Lee now. Yeah. Okay. Hello? Can you hear me okay, now? Great. Yeah. I hear you <laughs> great. great. Um, okay. So the question again uh, was, uh, what's what's a, an example of a use case uh, that you're excited about at Ontology, and yeah. what how does this benefit the service provider? Okay. Um, Actually, currently in sentient data, still in the very initial phase, yeah. it's the, still not kind of mainstream solution for most business scenario. But uh, based on the past three years, Ontology have do a lot of product and service, even the, the real use case uh, already. Uh, one case is we already uh, have a, a data, personal data wallet. The data wallet you can use, uh, everyone can use that to manage all the decentralized identity, their data source, uh, they are all credentials, and also include their digital uh, assets as well, and link to a different uh, uh, scenario uh, directly use uh, wallet. That is true for every individual to use, to manage their decentralized identity. Another case is in decentralized finance is quite 
DeFi is quite hot topic in blockchain industry right now. But you can find that currently most DeFi is kind of no um, credit information is there. All is based on the, uh, the just a different crypto is exchange or lending. But uh, credit coming, you need to involve people identity, KYC, personal information. Also include their own personal information on blockchain and off blockchain in the real world and the blockchain, how many digital assets you have. So we uh, have a credit based uh, financial service called WING, W-I-N-G. They will use the decentralized identity and data to verify your credit score, credit score. The credit score is based on your on-chain information, on blockchain, on Ethereum, on ontology. Also include your off-chain information, your uh, real nationality, your background. And then you can based on that, you can have some financial service. Um, that is better for that. Another the industry in Europe, we work together with um, Mercedes-Benz, the Daimler company have uh, for the automobile to uh, uh, application called Welcome Home. You can use that to manage your data in the in your car, different uh, driver uh, behaviors and other informations. You can manage the data by yourself. Sometimes you can send a message to insurance company or other finance company to pass on your automobile data to private service for you. So that is also a kind of case. Uh, based on that, we still have other internet case like the micro work is for jobs market. You can record all your work experience as a credential. You can reuse for in different uh, internet platform uh, to prove how many works, what kind of a work experience before online. So all those is real case already. We're still ex exploring uh, the more case in next phase. Yeah. Yeah, it's really great to hear. Um, next question for, for Ingo is that you talked about all these digital identifiers that were, were expanding, and it sounds like there's a lot more that's going to be identified um, with this explosion of that is probably going to come with the new wave of decentralized identification. Um, regarding all of these new identifiers and such, how is it, um, could there be more of an issue of more the ability to hide uh, false identities or have some inaccurate information that might be overlooked with this explosion of, of new credential, uh, this huge amount of credentials and identifiers. Mm, I think I don't really understand the question. So uh, you mean you have like how, how, how do you prevent fraud and like and in you know false identification? How do you ensure the accuracy uh, with the influx of all of these new identifiers that are coming out? Yeah, so, Who's doing uh, the checks and balances? Um, well, I think it's going to be quite well. So, so but just to rephrase the problem. Uh, so uh, basically, in an open system like that, I could start issuing driver's licenses now. Because I say I'm an attester now, I put, I, I'm going on one of those three blockchains, and I start issuing driver's license. They just cost five euro, uh, so uh, pretty cheap. Um, the problem with that is uh, that this business model is not really sustainable because no one will probably buy my driver's license because uh, the verifier is missing, right? So uh, nobody actually, uh, no policeman actually out there will um, accept a driver's license, which is just issued by Ingo. <laughs> so, uh, if the verifiers are missing, then the business model of the fraudulent attester basically uh, collapses. And th this is so it's, it's market driven. So there's there's nothing uh, on blockchain -y or, or so behind that. That's that's pure market mechanisms which are behind that. If But if I'm a, an attester which can uh, really do a good job. So for example, um, I'm now going to uh, be an attester for people being a nice person. Uh, so uh, I have to build some reputation out there in the world with, uh, with verifiers. So it must, it must be that someone comes to me and say, hey, please, can verify that I'm a nice person, that I not just give the credential to this person, I have to do some research if this is really a nice person. And if I do good research there, and I also do good marketing around my service, uh, then many people will probably accept that, and I will have a thriving business on accept, uh, on, on credentialing uh, that, and that people are doing, uh, that are they are nice uh, persons. Um, and But on the other hand, if, if I neglect my business model, so if I start now uh, to be fraudulent and just issue everyone just because I'm greedy and I want the money from for the attestations, uh, then this uh, this will actually 
make the round and people will find out about that and then my business collapses so i think the uh, this this thing is actually not solved by cryptography this is solved by market on top of that uh, we have nice things that are actually solved by cryptography uh, because on the when, when we think of the physical credentials we were talking about before when i take my driver's license and uh, show it to the guy who wants to rent me a car uh, this guy is probably going to compare the photo on the uh, on the driver's license with the guy standing in front of him and uh, if that doesn't match you would probably say hey this is maybe a good driver's license but probably this is not you so i'm not going to uh, give you the car um, this is things that we can solve cryptographically uh, because we can make cryptographic challenges uh, and find out if the uh, person presenting the credential is actually the person that is linked to it uh, by the decentralized identifier. So th this is what we can solve with crypto cryptography. The fraudulent uh, uh, things are, I think, more solved by market um, market uh, mechanism. If we would try to solve this with a machine, uh, I think we would move actually in the wrong direction for one, uh, because uh, people are used to have those authorities out there and uh, they uh, they will probably rather accept that. Um, so to make an example here, so in a credential could also be uh, somebody comes into my office. So there, there's a door and this door has to be opened by a key. Uh, so I don't want a crowd uh, intelligence or so to find out who actually can enter my office. Actually, I want to be the attester for who's going to enter my office or not. So I, I think we have, to, uh, we have to stick with those authoritative uh, attesters which do, um, which, which do own um, credibility in a community and then make a business on top of that. So I think this is the way to go. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, you I would like to add, to add something with a very simple example. Uh, I mean, I, I fully agree. Okay, uh, I think that right now there are many, many things which are already uh, they already have an identifier. Look, your computer, your motherboard has a has a unique serial number. All the serial numbers in the world, they they are registered in different repositories, managed in different ways. So, this decentralized identity system with verifiable credentials. Okay, verifiable credentials is the equivalent to the driver license. Uh, they are only going to improve this. It doesn't mean that it's going to be perfect, but there is only improvement. Think about, for example, in order to, to enter Spain, okay, right now, or in many countries, but in Spain, because this is what I know, you have to prove that you have taken a PCR test, a, a COVID test, PCR, lamp, or whatever, 72 hours before boarding or before arriving. Okay. Now, if you have a paper, you present the paper and then the verifier is the, is the agent in the airport of Spain when on arrival checking the paper. Now, can you imagine the nightmare that this is? This? How do you check that this is authentic? You have a, a, a lot of possibility to make fraud. The verifier credential, the digitalization of this, makes sure that you cannot tamper with this, that it is authentic. It may not be uh, true, but it's authentic. Authentic means that the attester said this about you point the attester may be lying but then you know the identity of the of the attester and cannot deny that the attester attested something about you which was not true at the end okay so at the end the attesters know that if they lie they are going to be caught so fraud is going to be reduced zero never reduced yes Cool. Yeah, I totally agree, though. It's, it doesn't uh, show truth, but it does show the authority of that. And that's that's a really good point to keep in mind when talking about identity. So I want to shift a little bit right now before we get to the audience questions uh, to, to quickly talk about technology and the technology stacks you're building on. Um, I do know that Ontology and Kilt are working with Polkadot and Substrate. So I'd like to uh, start first with Jun Lee and talk about why you decided to uh, work with Substrate and Polkadot. Yeah, um, Ontology is uh, uh, also is a power blockchain, um, but based on that, we will have the decentralized identity protocols, also include decentralized data exchange protocols. But the decentralized identity protocols is not only based on one blockchain, because we believe maybe different uh, identity, different entity will be registered in different blockchain even sometimes in the centralized uh, system, 
they should be link each other and uh, interoperation interoperation is important and Bogdal is kind of kind of linkage so ontology have a kind of u universal identity protocol plan is support uh, Bogta, Ethereum, Ontology, even some kind of centralized system. They all can link the decentralized identity protocol together. It means in next phase, once Bogta goes live, and uh, the everyone, some guys can register his identity on Bogta, use Bogta's account system. And also they can register Ethereum or Ontology, but they can work each other link each other to in different scenarios. So that is we're applying to do for uh, best on cool. Crocodile to do well, that. Thank you. Um, uh, for Jesus from Illustria, I know you're, you're, you've chosen Ethereum. What, what are some of the, the reasons you went with Ethereum? Oof, uh, that will be very long, but basically when we are started uh, uh, three years ago, uh, basically there was nothing else. Uh, actually, we, we didn't go with Ethereum. We, we, we wanted to implement a public permission network, blockchain network, which is public in a decentralized governance model and permission. So we needed something which was being widely used and there were many developers and many, uh, many thinkers about this, okay, uh, but permission. And that was basically the only choice. Now, having said that, we are agnostic. We have uh, started another uh, blo other uh, blockchain networks, uh, which are smaller with uh, with other technologies. But I would like to say something about uh, Alastria is uh, something is uh, starting in Spain. But uh, I am also part of the an initiative by the European governments, the European Commission and the European government, which is EPSI, the European Blockchain Service Infrastructure, which is coming to production very soon during this year. And this is basically a, an European blockchain network uh, for providing better services, cross-border services uh, from the public administrations to the to the citizens, okay? And this is uh, approaching production. And this is uh, implementing self-serving identity. And again, uh, they chose at the beginning, or we chose uh, also Ethereum-based technologies and also um, Fabric, okay? But uh, there is right now a PCP, a, a, a procurement process, which is open. So anybody can go and say to the European Union, okay, and there is money there, to say, hey, I have a fantastic blockchain technology which is fitted for the requirements. By the way, the requirements are related and is, are in the documents, okay? Uh, so uh, anybody can say my blockchain technology or my evolution of the blockchain technology is suited to these requirements, and the requirements again are suited to the uh, green economy, to the circular economy, to the tracking of uh, devices in the European Union. And then just give me, l l let me give you some numbers, okay? But basically, they are asking for something that can support uh, 500 million people, 13 million businesses, okay, in the same network, okay? Then uh, for IoT enable customs item tracking, okay? So devices entering the European Union and crossing, and crossing borders, uh, 25 million new product registrations per minute, 25 million per minute, 15 billion total transactions per minute, 15 billion per minute, uh, this is including uh, REITs, okay? And 120 trillion, 120 trillion, I repeat, updates over the course of one year, okay? So those are the requirements for uh, the next generation blockchain technology that the European Union is looking for to enable the digitalization of the whole European space. And this is a huge thing. So I would say that, okay, uh, when starting, it was a totally immature world. The, the, the blockchain is still immature, is, but has matured in three years uh, a lot. And I would say that anybody who really wants to solve the real problems cannot say this is the technology and this is going to be solving all the problems in the world that's impossible so you have to choose the technology depending on the problem and so on and you have to be agnostic if you yeah. really are at the, at the solution uh, space okay and then just try to fit the requirements to the people who are developing the blockchain infrastructure so they know exactly what requirements are the really important to solve the problems of, of, you, of humankind, not just of uh, investors, for example, okay? So I'm talking about the real economy, not just the financial economy. Yeah, okay. yeah, the, 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 it's definitely an early space, as, as Junli said before, and there's a lot of requirements that the technology is, is just catching up with. I do know that uh, Ingo and, and 
the people at Bot Labs working on Kilt protocol uh, are actively developing uh, for their solution some some new things for the Substrate uh, framework. Uh, what are some uh, what's been some of the activity you've been doing on Substrate? And then we'll get to audience questions. I'd, I'd like first to say why, why we actually, because I think it fits very good with the with the uh, the other two answers. Why, why we actually decided uh, to go on uh, Polkadot and, uh, and build on, on Substrate. Uh, the, the the thing was uh, you have well, we saw that in what uh, Jesus just said. Uh, you have basically two options if you want to uh, build verifiable credentials and DIDs on top of a blockchain. You can either use a fully permissionless system like you, like Ethereum or Bitcoin, um, and or you could use a permission system, right? Or uh, and, and this uh, where uh, Jesus uh, was going in this direction. We also saw some of the projects which went into the permissionless thing. So, uh, and we first thought maybe we build it on Ethereum, but uh, then we talked to people who would want to use it. And uh, especially when they're from industry, they say a uh, nice system, uh, especially very nice that it is completely permissionless. So the tr system includes the truth and we don't have to trust an entity, which is absolutely great. This is exactly what we want. Uh, but then uh, actually you can't say how much the gas cost is and it can go up. And when it goes up, then we I, the, we don't know about our production cost, right? And if you don't know your production cost, you can't make a cost for your product. And then the people say, we're off, I'm, I'm sorry. And uh, then a lot of projects uh, went into the direction saying, uh, let's make a permission blockchain like on Fabric or so. Um, and uh, then uh, the customers again came and said, yeah, nice system. And you also know the production cost, but unfortunately we have to trust people again or trust entities again. And this is ex exactly what we didn't want. Then we, if we want that, when, then we just use a database it's uh, so fast it can meet the requirements uh, which Jesus just said, uh, uh, but uh, you don't need blockchain for that. And uh, then came, so this is a dilemma. So either you have truth in the system or you know the cost, right? So uh, there's no way around that, uh, we thought. And then came Polkadot and now this is the solution for it. And this is our reason why we went actually onto this um, uh, in, into uh, into this development uh, because when we are a parachain, uh, we know the cost of uh, an, a transaction, so we can put a fixed transaction fee uh, to things, and still we do have the truth of a permissionless system in there because we derive the truth from the relay chain. And uh, I think this this uh, this technology of Polkadot is the the only, as far as I know, the only technology in the world which actually can provide this. So it is for us actually the perfect solution for providing decentralized identifiers and stuff like that because uh, industry is going to need it. Industry needs uh, uh, fixed gas prices and they also need the truth inside the system otherwise you always have to well, at least some big companies and this is exactly where we want to move away from so, uh, so uh, that, that's actually uh, the thing so uh, sorry for that so uh, but, uh, but, uh, uh, the question was uh, what are we providing um, so we're doing many things basically so uh, we, we're doing a lot in in the um, field of um, uh, of zero knowledge proofs, uh, hiding your identity because that's also this is something which is very much needed, especially in the DeFi uh, ecosystem, so that you can show a credential, for example, without revealing who you are, and uh, showing a credential two times without uh, revealing that this was the same person two times and stuff like that. That's uh, that's very much needed in the in the DeFi uh, ecosystem. So we're providing services like that. Uh, this is where we do a lot of research on right now. Nice, thank you. Okay, so we're running a bit short on time, so I won't be able to get through all the 17 questions that have been asked for sure. But um, I, I'm going to be asking a question and then uh, one of you uh, try to uh, raise your hand and take, take the answer if it applies. Um, right now, the top voted question was already answered kind of by Ingo, so I suggest when this when this is done, there will be a recording on our YouTube channel, which will be in the chat right now. So just watch uh, uh, Ingo's earlier response and on the video when it comes up. But the next highest voted question, um, it's kind of been answered, but I'd like to see if there's a better way to talk about this or if, um, which is when a business wants to work with another business on blockchain, they will need to know the identities of their counterparties. How how is this problem? How is this problem? Uh, how should it be solved? 
Okay, and let me let me let me take this one because this is exactly one of the things that we are doing. Okay, basically, uh, again, uh, the identities of businesses are completely different than the identities of people. Okay, and actually, they have totally different regulations going in opposite directions. The identities of the people have to be as private as possible, and then you have in Europe the GDPR and the data protection and so on. But in 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 the contrary, the identities of business have to be as public as possible. <laughs> they are public, the identities and mm, a lot of information about the identity. And at the end, if you're a business, a legal business, then you already have an identity, basically, not a decentralized identity. You already have an identity. For example, you have your VAT tax number in every country where you operate in the European Union, or you have your legal entity identifier if you are required to, to have this. Okay. So basically, outside of the blockchain, you already have identity. So it's just a problem of having the same uh, authority that uh, gave you the license to operate because you need a license to operate in whatever thing you do. Even if you are an entrepreneur, you have to ask your country for a, a, a tax ID, for example. And then this is the identity that can be registered in the blockchain associated with the rest of your identifying information. Okay, so in the case of businesses, it's much, much easier than in the case of uh, people. Because in the case of people, if you register some personal information in the blockchain, then you um, have a problem. Okay. So in the businesses, very simple. It's just the attester. If you are a, a university, for example, you already have a, 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 a university uh, identifier, okay? Because you are a university, and then you have the Ministry of Education of the country uh, gave you the authorization to be a university, basically. Okay. So this is the the, the, the scheme, and then uh, it's only a problem of registering this identity using the appropriate scheme and verifiable credential in the blockchain as a repository which is global and publicly known, okay? So in the case of businesses, I don't have any, any doubt that the blockchain is the best repository for this information because it's public. Nobody can change it. Nobody can deny it, okay? With persons, mm, I have my, my, my question, but businesses is very easy to solve, basically, okay? Easier than, than with people. Okay, thank you. Uh, anyone else? Or we'll just move on to the next question. And if any of uh, the panelists here uh, see any of the questions in the bottom that we don't get to uh, and would like to answer still, uh, they can comment on that and answer the questions uh, at, even after this uh, presentation is over. So uh, the next question is I find really interesting, which is like, how would one's identity genu genu genuineness and uniqueness be verified in a trustless way without the need for any government or any kind of centralized information source. So how can we, we show that like, I only have one identity. This is more around the personal identity side. So again, the question is, how would one's identity, uh, genuinity and uniqueness be verified in a trustless and decentralized way without the need for any government issuer? Well, um, maybe I can take that because um, there's, there's also an application we're working on for, uh, for doing that. So um, government uh, identity called KYC normally uh, will be needed for some things. So if you want to transfer a fiat money to a crypto uh, exchange, this will probably just be required by law. Uh, so we won't get out of that. Um, so uh, and, and it's OK. Uh, you can just Put, uh, uh, take a credential from a KYC provider and then you're good to go. Uh, there's other use cases where, uh, for example, a person just wants to have a social KYC. So just uh, link this, uh, link your uh, DID up to uh, your um, LinkedIn account, your Twitter account, your Riot account and whatever, uh, and maybe your GitHub account, and uh, then uh, and prove that you actually own those accounts, and then you have proven uh, that you are the person in a quite nice way. You can then maybe also attach a couple of Bitcoin and Ethereum addresses to that if you want, and then people know that, okay, the guy who has control over this Twitter account is also the guy sending me this address if you want that. Um, so that, 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 there's many ways that you can actually to do that um, and uh, sometimes they will be even more so the social things I, I think will be even more valuable than the government on things in a way uh, so there, there's many ways mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah I, I would like uh, also to, to add probably that uh, as Ingo said at the beginning uh, we don't have to confuse identifiers with identities okay mm -hmm. so the identity is exactly what you are if I am a national of Spain and then I have my Spanish ID in a digital form uh, generated by the 
the Spanish government, and then I go to a verifier and say, hey, you have to prove your uh, nationality. I cannot invent this. I can only present the only one that I have if I only have one nationality. So I only have one identity. I can choose what, which part of my uh, identity I present to the verifier, okay? But they have an identity point, okay? Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, the last question is all well, we have time for is how can uh, identity uh, help with um, credit? So either social credit or financial credit. Uh, how could it how could it be of assistance there? Yeah, I can I can answer this question because we already have the real case for that. Uh, based on the credit, actually from a different kind of source, we can think different dimensions for the credit or trust. One is from a legal system, like from centralized government, governments or company. Another is from technology, like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Procter, ontology, there's techni technology, private credit. Another kind of social credit, social trust, is from people by people. I trust you, you trust me. But how let people know how many people trust you? Like LinkedIn already do that. Some people, okay, I like you, I can prove you, I can I agree your points, or to, I I can I know I can be the endorser about your work experience. Uh, but seeing a social network, when you client something, maybe you can client something as a credential. I'm uh, the blockchain engineering for five years experience. But a new another stranger they don't know what this word is true or not. But once they find one hundred high trust people agree this point for example kevin would think okay, okay i agree that i know this guy they have five years technology experience so your client will be trustable they'll be have a credential they have some it's kind of credential it's also it's credit information you can use the credit information to create the credit score social credit score use the score build your trust in different scenarios so that means not only legal not only technology even the social network also can build the new kind of trust with the decentralized way. So that is the scenario. Actually, the actually I mentioned the decentralized financial service or decentralized financials already use those kind of credit score. You can use the credit score to apply the financial service already. So it's a good case for that. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting. It's really good to see the use cases coming very quickly. Um, and thank you. Uh, we're out of time right now. Thank you so much to all the panelists uh, for coming. Uh, I just put their, their information and websites uh, in the chat that everyone can see and click on and find out more about each of their services. Um, and this was one of the most, maybe the most popular attended uh, Web3 Talks uh, event. Uh, and we're very happy about that. To anyone here who wants to find out when we have more events coming up, uh, go to polkadot.network slash community, um, and we'd be happy to have you again. Uh, thank you again to all the panelists and everyone for coming. It was a really good, I enjoyed this a lot. Nope. Thank yeah, you very thanks, much. And, uh, thanks, everyone. I, I have to, there are many questions yeah. which are interesting, and we couldn't have time to answer them. And that's, yeah. uh, I, mean, I, I don't know if uh, something can be done, okay, offline or whatever. Yeah, I, you can answer I'm by ready. just commenting. You can answer uh, it, the now. questions right here. Yeah, and then those who answer ask questions can wait and see if they get answered. So you can just stay online. We'll end the, the stream, and you can keep answering questions. Okay. Okay. All right. That's good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.